Hello and welcome to this week's Devil in the Detail podcast with me, Paul Whiteside, and my very good friend, Paul Parkin. Good evening, Paul. Evening, Paul. How are we? I'm all right. It's just me and you tonight, mate. Rob's um, otherwise engaged, so uh, we'll have to try and uh, fudge our way through it. I'm sure we will. We've got we've got plenty going on, haven't we? We've got the news to talk about. We've got the, uh, the review of the Warrington game. We're also looking forward to Huddersfield. This week in the preview, I think there's a few interviews well with Jack Armroyd and Rob spoke to Paul Rowley, so there's plenty to look at, mate. Yeah, very much so. Another another good week, really, isn't it? It's a lot easier to talk about when when you're coming off the back of another win. So it's shame Rob's not not about. I'm sure he's off following uh, for the next big scoop. But uh, yeah, no, we'll, uh, we'll we'll get through it. I'm sure we'll manage. Well, we'll start off, I think, with a win against Warrington, uh, Paul. You're listening to Devil in the Detail, and this is your big match review. I mean, I'm not so sure I expected that comeback, but it was, a, it was a funny game. I think we won the game in the first half, then sort of chucked it away, and then won it again. What did you make of it? You're right. The strange thing was, before the game, when I looked at the lineup, so I was, I was a little bit worried. I looked at Warrington's team, and I thought, that's, that's a good team, that. that's a good lineup. But the, the one thing you can't buy is, is passion and heart. That's what our lads had in, in spades this week. We we started the game like out on fire, like we'd finished against Wake the week before. Just we looked so dominant. We looked like we could score when we wanted. We were making easy meters, which is something we don't we, we don't do. We seem to always struggle, and our forwards got on top really early. And and for me, the game really only hinged on that that Simbini, which I still I know he's. he's He's not giving it for that actual incident. He's giving it for constant penalties. But I don't know what them penalties were actually for. But that could have turned the game. And that's when Warrington had that spell, that that kind of 10, 15 minutes just before and just after our time, which could have killed us. This good a try, which should have been disallowed in the corner. I think it was Dulis. He was clearly out of play. But our lads just stood up. At no point during the game, strangely enough, even though it was 24-8, did I feel we were out of it. We just seem to have a spark about us this week again. And uh, and the way we're playing, the way we throw the ball about, it, it causes teams and, and, and team structures big problems. So besides that 10, 15 minute spell, I always, for some reason, felt we were in control. The forwards were dominant and the three quarters, especially the halfbacks, were, were dominant. Yeah, just an all-round great performance. I think, it, for me, it was a, there was an awful lot of composure shown there. I mean... With 24 minutes, 25 minutes to go, he's 24 8 down, you're staring down a barrel, aren't you there? But there was an awful lot of composure. But the backing up, the support play was superb. They just wanted it. I think sometimes in sport, you can have all the money you want, but the the, the team that wants it, it'll, it'll take it. And I think Salford did there in that. In that. But go, just going back to the first half, I mean, great start, I thought. I mean, we missed two, two kicks, but the two tries from Williams and Cross, 8 0. It's not a commanding lead, but. I felt we were totally in control there until the Sim Binning. I didn't think it was a Sim Binning at the time. I've watched it back on the Super League show and it just looks like he, the, the wanting to play around into Callum Watkins, really. So I think uh, a bit harsh that. But one, one thing I can say, just after that, a koala try-saving tackle there right at half-time. I think that was a... We needed that, didn't we? I mean, if that, that had gone over there, it, it might have been a bit too much for us to come back from. But what do you make of the Sim Binning? There's no way on earth. It's, the, the, the Warrington fellas run through the line. Watkins is clearly going across the field to try and make a challenge. He, if anything, it could have gone the other way. Because he's blocked our player. He has run through the line, but he's taken our player out. And then Watkins gets gets Sim I mean, it's, for me, it's, it's not in no way is it a penalty. Never mind. Sim Binning and another referee said, "Oh, you, you've given away four or five. He's right on our try line. This is a you know a pivotal moment in the game. I think he's made a really bad decision there, the referee. I'm not sure he'd done it if it'd been the other way around. The Warrington defender had done that, and I felt for Callum because he, he'd, he'd had a couple of for him uncharacteristic moments in that first half where he dropped the ball or he passed the ball to you know to, to touch or whatever. I think it just capped off a, a, a half for him and he. he it made him more determined when he came back on because he, again, an absolute animal, the lad. He's, he's brilliant. He's in uh, probably some of the form of his life at the moment in the back row. Key thing for me following that, though, was the defence. I know Warrington scored, but they had a lot of ball in that period just before half-time. And our defence, and you mentioned there the Akawala uh, challenge, every man just, just did their bit. You know, they pulled together. And I think that's something that we've got at the moment. We've got such a small squad and... It's even smaller, you know, this week we lost uh, 
Taylor, obviously, with the suspension before the game. Burgess pulled out before the game. You know, we're getting smaller and smaller. I think it makes us a tight-knit team somehow. It works in our favour a little bit. And every single one of them is fighting for each other. And you could see it clearly. The, the passion to, to defend that line against a really good Warrington team, you know, a strong attack. So, yeah, they, they, you know, we were down to 12 men and, and the pressure was really on. It was going to tell. Can't hold back for that long and... Uh, they did go over, and I, I said at the time, I, said, I don't think they score without the referee making them decisions. Yeah, obviously at the start of the second half. I'm going to mention something to you about Paul Rowley in a minute, but we'll just chat about the second half in a second. Uh, Ratchford went over, with up, and then that Thewlis try, 24 points to eight. I thought that the introduction of Chris Atkin perked yeah. us up a bit. That try he scored there, it was a lovely offload from, from Callum Watkins. The hero of the hour, Jack Ormond, right? I mean, he's a bit <laughs> of an unlikely one, but to, to be fair to, to Jack... I think I said to him in the interview and spoke to him after the game, he's been around rugby league quite a while now. He's no spring chicken. He's late 20s, 30s. Played at Leeds, played at Featherstone. He's enjoying his rugby league now. You, you can tell he, he's hitting a bit of form, isn't he? He's playing games. He's getting game time under his belt. He, he looks a, a real a real good forward now. He's got plenty of size about him. And he's six foot five, or whatever he is. Mm. And that that's what you need a modern day for. And I was really, really happy for him because he, he's a really grounded bloke as well. And... Um, he could be in a shout for a World Cup spot. You know, he's Jack. He's come on so much this season. It, it's bizarre. At the start of the season, I was thinking, he's just not got that. Whatever it is that makes the next level player. He's a big lad, but he's not, not a huge unit. He's, he's very tall, but he's, he's quite lean. He doesn't seem to have the impact. And I'd say over the last two months, he's turned into a, a real prop forward, a real sort of... I, I think if he was... A couple of years younger, you'd certainly be thinking that way about international honours, perhaps. He is 29, 30 now, so he's probably on the on the cusp. But as a forward, you do mature later. Yeah. And I, I, I'm like you, I'm really happy because he seems to have worked at things. He seems to have found his home here now. And, and his skills have improved. In the last couple of years while he's been, he's, he's dropped the ball quite a bit in challenges, you know, because of, they, they see a big man, so two or three men go in and force an error out of him. All that seems to have stopped and he seems to have developed. And then I listened to the interview he gave you at the end of the game and he was brilliant. He's so confident, such a... I've never really heard him speak, but actually, you know, he's very knowledgeable, but very calm as well. Yeah. A lot of rugby league forwards aren't the sharpest, Daddy, let's just say that. Um, but he started, he came across really well and I think Rob's done this interview with, 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 with Paul Rowley and, and a few others and, and he mentioned Jack and it the maturity of him and, and a bit, the fact that he's a bit of a leader off the park as well, yeah. which you wouldn't see. So I'm really happy for him and I think that was a massive thing for us. You mentioned Jack, but our forwards are on Sunday again, name them all, but the, especially the, the, the sort of front row, whoever came on, whoever replaced whoever, made massive, massive impact. Gives a real platform to work off. And then when Chris Atkin comes on, and we've said this before, he really does speed the play up. A real crafty player, Chris. A very clever player as well. And probably a little bit underrated. It does offer us something because obviously we lost Andy Ackers, which is a massive shame because I think Andy's been in, in, in superb form for the last couple of months. And another player that's probably gone under the radar a little bit. But as soon as he goes, you bring on Chris Atkin and the game seems to step up again. Mm. He's quick around the, the acting half. and But he is a, you know because he's an halfback, he's got them brains. He knows where to be, and again another player that I've never—he's never let us down. In all the time he's been with us, and he's in and out and in and out of the team. I know he had an injury, but even even before that, he could be great form. And he's like he's the one to miss out at the time, and I do feel for him. But again, he got his rewards him and Jack this week um, for for just being honest players, you know, doing your job. I think with Chris Atkin, you know, and a lot of the other players, but Chris Atkin for me. He's he's a player with a very very good attitude. He he doesn't sulk. He he's a pro. He's a pro. When he's called upon, he'll come on and do his job. And then obviously when he's when he's not there, he's still working either around. And I think that's what you've got at the moment. Jack Armrod's another one. I mean, one guy who I want to mention. Well, two really. I mean, Tyler Dupree. We'll get onto him in a minute. But Alex Gerrard. I think he's coming. A few people said to me, "What are we signing him for?" You know, he's been a bit of a bit of a make weight. He's played at Leeds. Played at Witness. But he's coming. And I tell you what, he. he He's busted a gut every week. He's not just an head down forward. He likes to mm. offload. He likes a neat little pass. He played like a standoff on Sunday. And I think he's really, really brought something to the party. And I think he's brought Jack Armoride on for me. Those two really, really complement each other well. Uh, so I'm really chuffed with Gerard. Tyler Dupree, I think we've got to talk about Tyler. I think 
he was tremendous in that second half, and we, we we've got a, we've got a player there, haven't we? And I'm delighted to see him in the team. So much talent there, real youngster, but you know, playing with a real maturity. What what do you make of Tyler Dupree? I, I just echo everything you just said about him. Since he come in, you know, we didn't know anything about him really. I know he's been around in, in, at Leeds, and I believe he actually started with us, didn't he? Yeah. In our academy years back, he, but he, he seems so. Just got his chance now and thought, this is it. This is this is where you know I want to be. I want to be a Super League player. And um, what what a player he's got! Uh, unbelievable hands for a big a big lad. He's got a good turn of pace as we saw against Wigan a few weeks back when he made that break. You know, on that day he did was it 170 odd meters in a yeah. game. You know, Rob brings him up every week, doesn't the stats about meter makers, and we're like, oh, he might have made 100 meters if we're lucky. He was, and he came off the bench and only played, you know, probably 40 minutes of a game. He's been an absolute revelation, the lad. He's got the lot. And you mentioned, you know, Jack Armour on, on, about being an international. I think this kid could. I really do. Let's let's not forget, he's not to Super League pace yet. He's coming halfway through a season from a championship team, a struggling championship team. Mm-hmm. Let's not say that. You know, I'm not having to dig at witness at all, but that's that's the truth of the matter. Part-time rugby. He's come in now and he just can't... I, I can't believe what I'm watching with him. Him and Gerard. Both obviously from from witness as well. I think the same happened with Alex. I think he's taking his chance, and I think he, he knows that this is the one where he can he can really make a, a an impact on the game. He's he's got really good skills, Alex Gerard. Really for a, for a big forward, really good ball handling skills, and and he's something we've probably lacked for a couple of years. Somebody like that, and I think signing the contract will have helped him as well because he knows now where his future is for the next couple of years, and he he can concentrate on his rugby. He's not. He's been, yeah, he's been playing part time rugby in the lower leagues, and then he's come to Super League, and he, you know we offered him a probably a short term deal, and he didn't know what he's going to do next year. Now he knows he's here for two years. He can just get on with being a rugby league player, and I think him and Tyler are, are setting us up with a real good few years. You know these these two together can develop uh, a couple more players come in, add to that squad, hopefully get a few players back in, you know, and, and not be so unlucky with injuries. Have a, a, a sort of nice big solid pack, and these these are going to be real leaders, uh, and we're really lucky to have them. We we spotted two two really good talents there, but Tyler Dupree is. I, I hope we don't burn him out because he's not going to get chance for a rest because there's just nobody to cover for him. Um, but at the moment, just just keep doing what you're doing because he's been an absolute sensation. Yeah, he's, he's a real fan. He's a real GM, one for the future, but one for the present. I think something my dad's always said to me: if you're good enough, you're old enough. And I think yeah. it's great to see young players getting a chance. You know, finally, uh, looking back at the Warrington game, last try of the game went to Ryan Braley. I think I about five players could have scored there. They, they all burst through. I think the support play and the will to win in that last 20 minutes for me was tremendous. And Ryan Braley, I think he deserves a good mention. I mean, a player that's took a bit of stick this season from yeah. various supporters and people doubting him. And I think he showed up every week. Ryan puts it in every week. And one thing I, I heard on, on Sunday was the soft supporters chanting that he's one of our own. And I think they've really took a warming to him now, and you know credit to him, he's a smashing lad off the off the pitch when I've spoken to him, and and he he, he wants to to work for Salford. He's you know a, a localish lad. He, he supported the team as a, as a boy, and sometimes it doesn't work out that does it. I mean you can try your best, but I think it's it's great to see you know when something like that happens and, and he's getting the reward. So uh, congratulations to Ryan. You know he got he got the try. I don't know what the celebrations about with the way he pins his ears back. What's all that about? <laughs> I don't. I'm not I don't know. Sure. I know they call him Kez. He, I think Kez is his nickname, isn't it? Has he got really big ears? I've never really noticed. I don't I'm know. I don't know. That, unless you're just telling everybody, you know, I can't hear you now. I've got to go. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. no, brilliant. I mean, that last try just showed. You've mentioned there the support play. Yeah, yeah. We rushed through together. Yeah. Nobody knows you're going to break the line. No. You know, you can try and break the line, but no one knows you're going to. How many times in the past have you seen a soft play get his head through the line, look round, and go, "Where's, where's my support?" You know, he, he used to be a bit of a trait of ours. Yeah. This time, there was five or six players just rushing up either side. He could have gone anywhere. And the thing about Ryan is when he's, he's done it the last couple of weeks, when he scores, it's the smile on his face Yeah. yeah. when he goes over. And he scored in front of the Salford fans on both times. And that one this week, you know, obviously he knew he, that's the game he'd done. It's, you know, there's no way to come in back from that. He killed the game. And he, the grin on his face when he scored, it was like what we were doing on the terrace. Except he probably wasn't going quite as mental and getting covered in beer, but um, <laughs> it, it was unbelievable. You know, and that you love that passion. That's what you want to see from players. And obviously, being a Salford fan, he he, he connects with 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 us. So yeah, I'm, I'm delighted for him. I think 
I think the style of rugby we're playing now is what he wants. It's what he, what he needs. We, we're no good trying to barrel up the middle, take teams on. Let's let the ball do the work. And we've got some unbelievable players. Even even in the pack in the back row there, when you've got Watkins and, and Levette, both real good rugby players. Ball gets out wide, and that's where someone like Ryan Briley is going to shine. Because that's what he does. You know, he chimes into the line. He scores tries. He, he's not going to knock three or four men out of the way, let's be honest. He's not. The, the one man for me again on, on Sunday was, was Brodie Croft. What what an unbelievable performance. I even heard the Warrington fans after the game talking about him. You know, some come over talking to me and said, you've got you've got some players there, you know, and they, they all mentioned Broder. To, to each one, I told them to keep their hands off. Um, <laughs> he, he just... He's just got that thing, hasn't he? Whatever it is that these players have, that special... And you need that. Yeah. We've got a lot of really good, honest, hard-working players. We've got a lot of players with a, you know, skill and talent. But he's just a package. He really is. He knows when to chime into the game and when to do what he needs to do. And Warrington couldn't handle it. You know, that half break he must have made was, was crazy. But yeah, you know, and obviously, like we said, he hasn't got a massive pack in front of him to sort of lay a, a huge platform. So... It's important that we, we play a way that suits him, and, and we are doing. I mean, I've singled out Brody Croft, but I don't think there's one player on that pitch in that squad on, on Sunday that you wouldn't say, well done, you had a great game. The whole day, you know, the, the coming back, the, the resilience we've shown, we could have gone, could have ended up being an absolute thumping. We could have put our heads down. There's not, there's not a lot to play for in many ways. You know, a lot of these players, some of them will know they won't be here next year, some, you know, whatever. They could have just gone, look, game's gone at 24-8, let's just go through the motions, try and keep the score down. No, it wasn't that. It was a case of, well, let's get a try back and let's let's see where we go from here. And from that first try, as soon as we scored, it, you, you could see that it kind of broke Warrington as well. It broke their spirit and they must have realised that we're not going away. And uh, full credit for them and, and, and the coaching staff for keeping the lads going. And, you know, we've just got to keep looking forward now. It's, it, it looks really good, you know, the, the results kind of went our way a little bit. It's some of the results, you know, the league table will look after itself, but as it is at the moment, there's no pressure on us now. Let's just go and enjoy it. I think what you were just saying there, I mean, it just shows how well the team played. We were talking about players there and singling players out. I don't think you can single anybody. I think the the, the whole team played well. We could we could mm. speak all night, but neither of us mentioned Brody Croft at the start. That's so it just shows you how well the rest of the players are playing because Brody Croft was outstanding. Yeah. But you sort of get talking about other players and then and then lose track. But uh, but no, before we give the the free word match reports out, I was just going to mention something that came into my head the other day. I've listened to a few Paul Rowley interviews. I spoke to him a few times. I've been to his press conferences and I listened to what, what Rob says to him. Do you think there's a bit of the sort of Alex Ferguson about him, like the siege mentality, where he does take the pressure off the players a bit? Um, I won't say he was outspoken, but he looks after them, doesn't he? I think. I think we're seeing that now, and and there is that sort of not the world's against us sort of thing, but I don't know. He he, he defends the players, and I, I think. Being a bit of an outsider, I know he's a Lee, a Lee man. He seems to really bought into Salford, and and just watching him on the pitch at the the weekend, you know, in the huddle with the players, he's coming over, meeting the supporters, shaking hands with the supporters. He really has. I think the supporters have really took Paul Rowley to heart now. Yeah, I think I think it was you early in the season that said it, and we've we've said it in previous podcasts that he doesn't get carried away either way. When you get beat, he's not singling people out, he's not criticising, he's you know he defends his players. And then when we win, he doesn't get, you know, he doesn't float away with the fairies. He keeps it, you know, real and, and tells it as it is. You know, and he'll pick up that there might have been a mistake or we didn't do this, we lost a bit of intensity or we, you know, our discipline or he'll, he'll turn it round whichever way. And I think you're right. I think that, that, that siege mentality is definitely there and it's been transferred to the players. And I think they realise now it's us versus everybody else. Yeah. You know, and sometimes... Again, I saw it on Sunday, and I, I do mention it a lot, but uh, I thought the referee gave, especially in that first half, several penalties against us, which, I'm, you know, I would scratch my head. And you could see the players getting despondent mm. and having a word with the ref and saying, well, what, what's this for now? Yeah. And it, it kind of, I think it just gave us more strength. And I think that comes from the coach. That, um, I think it might have been the OKR okay game a few, what, a month or so back when we got beat, and we were off. We were at, there's no disguise in that, and, and nobody would, Disagree, and at one point in that game, it felt like a Sean McRae era game. Mm-hmm. But it just seemed like even the you know because like, for, for me a lot of the time Sean McRae didn't care. He'd done what he'd done. 
you know, Salford was beneath him in many ways. He was doing a job, but he wasn't really bothered about. And, and he felt like that was on the pitch. And then over the last couple of weeks, we've seen it completely reverse. And it, it, it seems that Paul Rowley and, and Kurt Agassi and Danny O now have got this message there saying, look, you know, you're good players, but there's only you that can do this. There's only you that can make this happen. I, but you're absolutely right. I think I think what he's done is he's instilled in them this, this defiance. That, you know, no matter what what you try and do, and how you try and put us down, we're not going anywhere. You know, we're gonna we're gonna be that 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 hornet around your picnic. You know, you can try and try and get rid of us all you want, but we, we we're too good for that. And there's a lot of players there with a lot of points to prove as well. Players who've been not cast off, maybe maybe written off a little bit by other people, and then people who we are giving chances to, like we've mentioned, Alec Gerrard and mm-hmm. and Tyler Dupree and. And Jack, and you know all these players who have been elsewhere and maybe not made the the, the full grade, and see this is their chance. And, and Paul Roll is just putting his faith in them, saying, "Well, you know, you go and do it. You go and show them how good you are." Um, and it's good to see that battle hardened thing because that that's always been a thing of of Salford, really. You know, as a as a sitter, you know, we know that it's it's, it's gritty and it's tough, but you you get things done, and we're always the underdog. Uh, and I, and I think I think that suits us at the moment, and I think it suits Paul Rowley and his his attitude to to life in many ways. Whisper it quietly, but there's there's real sort of similarities between 2019 and uh, and 2022 for me after that game at the weekend. But I'm not going to go on about that because. You never know. Let's have a look at these three word match reports from the the weekend before we move. I'll tell you what. Before we do that, we'll have a listen to uh, to Rob's press conference with Paul Roller, and uh, I also caught up with uh, Jack Homer and I was stalking him outside the ground, and I caught up with him outside the ground. Here's the interviews. Right, delighted to say I've been joined by Jack Homer. Two tries in that second half. Uh, it, is there any a, a chance you could have got an asterisk there late on? Because you, you were hanging back there, you know, for that try at the end when scored. You must be delighted, though. Great performance. Yeah, it's, 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 it's rare to get over to one try, never mind two for me. So, the actually, I, I don't think, I think that's out of the question for the rest of my career, really. You showed but a no. nice step there, nice side <laughs> yeah, yeah, step yeah. as well. It's a big gap, though, that you went yeah, through. Yeah, it was, yeah. Great pass from Sneedy, but it's, I'm, not, I'm not too fussed about the tries, really. I'm, I'm more happy with the performance and the way we came back. Um, when Cal got sent off, I went 24 8 down, it was that was some big ask, that. but it's yeah. showed great character. Yeah, that's what Rolls just said in the changing rooms there. It's proud of us all, showed a really good character to be able to come back. It looked a nice touch on the field at the end there. Paul Rowley came on, I don't know what you're all saying, I don't want you to tell us, but that team spirit that you're building here seems seems pretty special there that you've got that bond between the group. That's it, really, that's that's what it was. Just Brody, Brody Croft just saying that he's how proud he is to, to play alongside us all, and I think it's just it shows how, how close we are, really, to be able to, to come back from like we did. Um, through a bit of adversity to uh, just it's, we're a tight group and I think that'll stand as a good stead going forward You've been involved in Mobili quite a while now is this one of the best times you've had in Mobili? It is for me yeah because well, it's only the last couple of years really here where I've been playing week in week out so it's always in and out of the team but I've, uh, I've found myself playing every week and a great set of lads um, especially this year so it's it's really good it's, especially when we're winning that makes a difference it's, it's hard when you're we're losing three or four in a, in a row like we have done earlier in the season but it makes a massive difference when we get wins like a couple of wins like we have done so I just think to keep that going How did it feel that when you got over I mean the first try was good but the second try you nearly brought the roof off that stand yeah. I was stood behind the goals there and it must be an absolute buzz that for a, you know, yeah. for a player who doesn't get over very often yeah. if you can see old oh, Joe Burge is great yeah, no, but for you Oh brilliant yeah. Fans are great out there I think last week they were, they were massive for us against Wakefield in that big win and there's a few quite a fair few of them travelled today um, it's a massive help especially like, like I say we went down 24-8 and they're still, they're still team for us so it uh, makes a massive difference so I appreciate it moving up that table as well you've gone to 7th today big game with field next week but you can just look at one game at a time now can't you keep building it that's how things seem yeah, to be going yeah. at the moment I think just take, take confidence from what we're doing um, and just like I say go week by week I I, we can't carry away too carried away with ourselves um, it would have been easy to do that last week against winning by get a record score winning by 70 but I think we've just got to take each, take each week as it comes a new week and um, just keep working hard for each other and I think if we do that then the results will keep coming I've spoke to about a dozen supporters coming out today and they've all said today was better than last week I think it's the performance today I mean it's alright scoring 74 points but I think the comeback and the manner of that display has really impressed everybody yeah I think that last week was a great feeling because I think last week was a big game as well we talked about it before the game we were both both on 10 points second, second, second bottom last week so that was a must win game really 
um, I think we showed um, great great resilience to come through that game and win the way we did. But even even more so today, I think we, we spoke about this week. Last sorry, last week not not mean anything if we didn't back it up today. Um, we managed to do that, so it's, it's a good feeling. So hopefully we can do the same again next week. Have a great week, prep mate. Enjoy tonight because you deserve Cheers, it. Mate, Cheers, Jack. <laughs>
Uh, Dave Nocter, real character Sean, Armin Ride, Chris and Janet Shen, and keeping the faith, man of match, Armin Ride. Oh, and what a great try saving tackle from uh, Satellaka Akawala. Phil Rogers, never say die, Armin Ride, Ricky P. Is he the one with the dogs in sale? <laughs> Ricky <Yes>. P. Yeah. <laughs> Dan Fine Salford, man of the match, Armin Ride. Colin Reynolds, what a win, man of the match, Brody Croft. So yeah. there's a bit of a theme there to Armin Ride, but Colin Reynolds. Going for uh, for Brodie Croft, Richard Morton, unbelievable team spirit. Arm and Ride, Steve Bennett, total rugby league man of the match. Arm and Ride, Matthew Salford get battered. He uh, did, he didn't go with the man of the match, but uh, yeah, I thought that was uh, quite a quite an iconic chant that from 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 Warrington. It soon turned round that. <laughs> yeah, it didn't age well, did it? <laughs> uh, Mark said a fantastic performance, Dupree. Dave Parker, absolutely fantastic. Salford get battered everywhere they go. Croft. Uh, super smashing great Colin Wilson man of the match Jack Armouride Jamie Ball watching Salford away KDL man of the match team effort uh, Sarah Bocott man of the match Mark Sneed had the belief they could win Gary Wheel fan Dabby Dozer and his was Sir Tyler Dupree so yeah a bit of a mixed bag Jack Armouride getting plenty but like we said before t- real team effort I mean we were talking about Reese Williams off air when he came in and you know, took took the place of Jack, uh, Joe Burgess and, uh, and and was great. So I think for me, like you said, everybody did the job, didn't they, on Sunday? Yeah, and uh, another player that didn't get a mention was Tim Lafay. Yeah, he get, was was just brilliant again. Causes so many problems. You know, you get one on one with him, you, you won't fancy facing him because he's a real, real awkward customer. But uh, no, he's got. You know, the, the lad that I was with, he, he lives in Warrington. He, he was. Uh, he said halfway through the second half, what a difference Jack Armanroyd had made when he came back on. Mm. Obviously, he had his spell. Um, and he's obviously made a huge impact. And everyone, I know he scored two tries, which are a prop. He's, he's unheard of, isn't it? I mean, very, very rare that'll happen. But um, but they were just barge overs. You know, he didn't just get it from 10 yards out and take, try and take men on. He, they, you know, they were the end of good moves, good tries. Um, and yet, he's got to be in that right place at the right time. Again, supporting. The one off, off Tyler Dupree, you, you know... I, they, just just being there, waiting for that offload, sensational stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted for Jack. It's good to see him getting some some points on the man of, uh, man of the match uh, uh, reports. Uh, Brody obviously got a couple of mentions. Sneedy got one in there. You know he's, he doesn't get mentioned very often, and you you forget about the controlling sort of influence that Mark Sneed has. He doesn't he doesn't shine in the way that Brody does. He doesn't take the line on perhaps as much or. You know, make them sparkling half breaks and, and little things like that. But he gets us around the park and he's kicking game. He's it, it's devastating at times. You know, when he needs to keep the ball in play, he'll do that. He'll turn him round when he knows he needs to find touch to kill a bit of time. Do that. Um, yeah, another, another great performance. And then obviously Tyler Dupree getting a couple of mentions as well, which we, we you know we spoke about him. We know what prospect he, he really could be. I think as well, before we move on, there's, there's there's players at the club who perhaps don't get mentioned because I think Lafayette's one, I think Dion Cross is another one. They're so oh. consistent every week. You sort of just expect them to be an 8 or 9 out of 10, don't you? And yeah. and we and we don't sort of wax lyrical about them. So uh, so that, that that that's great yeah. to see. Yeah, mate, you've just mentioned Dion Cross. Uh, I, I know our friend Paul Hugh came up with a stat, didn't he, after the game? Is yeah. He, is he... The only the fifth Salford player to score in five consecutive Super League games. This was a guy who was playing part time rugby last year in the Championship as a winger. He's now he's now a, a, a Super League centre of some repute, really. Uh, and five tries in five matches is is brilliant. And he's again another player that's not let us down. He's played every week, never let us down. Another really really good find. And you know wherever we're getting these players from, I I don't know, but. At the start of the season, you'd have looked at our squad and he probably, no disrespect, wouldn't have been in the, the, the 17. You know, because obviously you'd expect Sargentson to, to be in there if he was fit and you'd have had CO and Burgess and, you know, th- them kind of players. Watkins probably the other centre before we got Lafayette. But he's come in and made that place his own and next year it'll be his spot. You know, someone's going to have to come and try and take it off him. Uh, and that won't be won't be easy because his performances this year have been outstanding. But one one thing I do want to mention, I realised today that the amount of players we had missing or just unavailable on on uh, Sunday made that game even more. I, I don't know what the word is at the moment, but it, uh, we, we we went into that game with something like 
44% of our first team squad missing. Mm. Now that is, uh, you know, you ask any team to, to go through that, never mind a team with, with a squad like ours, you know, we've got no academy to back us up, we've got nothing, these players aren't getting weeks off. And like I say, we lost Taylor and, and Burgess from the week before when we couldn't afford to lose anybody. And losing, so you know, you're not far off a half a squad missing, and you're going away to Warrington and and dominating. That that's just the, the effort that these lads are putting in at the moment, and you can't help but just be full of uh, full of respect for them. Yeah, you you spot on, mate. Absolutely spot on. I think you know with Dion Cross. I mean, I don't know what he does after the game. He must be like Harry Houdini because I never <laughs> see him. I'd love to interview him, and every week I stand outside the change room door there waiting, and he never comes out. So he, I don't know where he goes unless he comes, unless he's like the master of disguise. I never ever see him. So hopefully try and catch up with him at the magic weekend because uh, I'd like to have a chat with him. But but yeah, moving on, we'll have a chat now about the uh, about the news and what have you before we preview the the Huddersfield game. Just got a few quick fire things here. I've uh, just been reading. I think the club have just put on uh, on the Twitter feed. Tomorrow is the last chance you can buy your Magic Weekend tickets. Well, we're recording this Thursday night, so if you're listening to this Friday, they go off sale tonight at four pm. So uh, so make sure you get you get your tickets. I think there's a link on the uh, the club's Twitter page website to to get the tickets for the Magic Weekend. I'm not sure whether you can buy them on the on the door on the day. I'm not too sure. At the Magic Weekend as well, the learning disability team are uh, are taking centre stage. So uh, they're going to be on there as well. So that's great for them, Paul. We've spoke about them this season, haven't we? And great to go and, and play at St James Park at such a such a big event. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? To, to make sure everybody's involved. I think they had something last last year when we went just outside the ground going on. It may have been something similar, um, but it's brilliant. You know, it is, I suppose it is a weekend, a bit like the Challenge Cup final in many ways, where rugby league gets to celebrate itself. Um, I know it's more it's, it's it's a super league thing, but um, yeah, it is good. It's, it's great for them. Long trip up there, long trip back. Um, but uh, I'm sure they'll love it. You know, and the amount of people who get to see it. You know, people who from other clubs who don't have have what we've got. It's a chance for them to go and see and support. And I just hope all the all the uh, the, the whole team really love it and have a have a great day out. The, the weather's good. The atmosphere will be brilliant. It always is. I just hope they they, they enjoy it. And you know, everybody who's who's there helping and working with them, you know, has great success. Well, I think the weather's going to be good, mate, so it's looking like it's going to be a good weekend. The weekend after is a double header at Salford. Um, Salford played Catalans uh, next Sunday, the 17th of July, AJ Bell Stadium. The ladies play Hull KR at 12.30, followed by the men's game at 3 o'clock. Tickets are available for that as well on the uh, on the Facebook page, website, or whatever you want to do. I think you just click on these these links now, don't you, for stuff? It's a bit over my head. Ticket office as well, I presume you can go to, can't you? Uh, there's also some summer rugby camps as well. Uh, so for Red Devils, Red Devils Foundation uh, school holiday camps. You know, if you want to get involved with that, Eccles Sixth Form College, I think it's at uh, Wednesdays, 12.30 till 1.30. The dates are the 3rd, the 10th, the 17th and the 24th of August. To email, uh, sorry, to book, you need to email craig.fisher at salfordcc.ac.uk. If you're a Twitter old fay, get on there because uh, the Salford Red Devils Twitter page is full of that stuff. But get involved with that. Um, you can, uh, you know, that's good stuff, isn't it, Paul? You know, for the uh, for the summer holidays. Is, is there an age group on that? Is it sort of just uh, you know different times for different ages, or is it all just in one place? Does it say? Uh, it doesn't say an age thing, Paul. Why are you thinking of getting involved? Huh? No, no, I'm just thinking of you know families. Obviously, all the kids have primary school right through to high school and. You know, they're all off in the summer. I was just wondering whether there's an age range that can go or or whatever. I don't know. So it might be worth just uh, having a dig about that. We'll have a, have oh, a look at that. T- he says 10, 10 years plus. It's Wednesdays, right. Wednesdays, twelve thirty till one thirty. So it's ten years. Right. So it's people over ten. So me and you, me and you could go then, couldn't we? Yeah, 10. yeah, might learn something. <laughs> <laughs> just to add to the uh, the excitement of the magic weekend if you're going up there for the weekend or if you're up there friday gateshead thunder oh, sorry newcastle thunder gateshead thunder going back there that way newcastle thunder are playing bradford bulls at 745 it's just five pound entry uh when you show your magic weekend ticket at kingston park so if you've got a ticket for the magic weekend you can get in there and watch uh, watch the thunder play bradford bulls at kingston park 745 kickoff on friday night. they're having a good season aren't they newcastle thunder in the, in the championship 
Yeah, they've picked up a few useful wins. They're, they've got some good players, to be honest. I know they've got picked quite a few up from Wigan, didn't they, last year? And there are a few few names there that you know. And obviously, Bradford going up there is a big a big draw anyway. I'm sure Bradford fans will travel well. So it'd be nice to see a big bumper crowd up in, in Newcastle because I think I, I think there's a future for rugby league up there. I think it got it got well taken up when Gates had had a team. You know, in, obviously back in the Super League years back. In the nineties, was it? And uh, yeah. before their merger, I say merger, take over from Hull. Um, and I, but I think there is a future for rugby league in the North East. I really do. It'd be nice to get you know, but if if the 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 locals can see people turning up and you know travelling up there, they'll get interested in what's going on. What is this? You know, and, and get involved with the sport. And obviously, the, the Magic Weekend being there. Um, you know, we we benefited with with getting you know Big Sam Luckley from up there. It's uh, there are players down who have got Daryl Alfitts from, from Newcastle, didn't we? A couple of years back. Yeah, before he yeah. went. So, I think there are, there are players around and I think, like I say, there's a future there in the North East. So, it'd be nice if we could get a, a good crowd for the, for the Thunder game and, uh, you know, a, a good advert for the game. Yeah, and uh, final bit of news, the Rugby League World Cup. It's just 100 days away, I think, until the, the Rugby League World Cup starts. They count down to... You know, for a massive competition that's going to be, you know, the the wheelchair World Cup as well, like, and all the other things that are going on, ladies and and the men's. What what are you looking forward to most about that park? Is it going to be playing Australia? Uh, definitely not. No, um, <laughs> that that will terrify me. Uh, no, I think I think that for me, it's always about the, the smaller nations, the World Cup. We know what we're going to get from Australia, the Kiwis, ourselves. You know, even even France and everything, but. But you've got Greece in there this time. I think Jamaica are in it. You know, teams like that. They're the ones that fascinate me. I want to see what they've got and what, you know what I mean? I want to see these countries develop. I know Italy were in it last time and we've had Lebanon. and You know, they're the ones that get me. And that's what that's what rugby league really needs. It's what we lack compared to our union rivals, that international game. And it needs to develop. And that's what I like to see the most, that... The smaller games, if you like, no disrespect to anybody, but um, you know what you're going to get when England meet Australia. You know, it's going to be fireworks and the Tongans are going to be around, Samoans and Fijians. Um, but I think it's going to be a really good tournament. I think if if we could take the Aussies out of it, I think, I think you'd probably tr- struggle to pick a winner. I really do. I think you, the, other, the other bigger nations, if you like, in, in rugby league terms, are, are all pretty close. To each other, I think they can all win it on the day. I just think the Aussies are that much further ahead if they bother to take it seriously. Um, it'd be nice if they did. I was listening to uh, the Five Live podcast the other day with Dave Woods talking to a guy from Oz, and he was, you know, he was saying, "Yeah, we're, we're well up for it. You know, it's just selling the game to to the public at the moment, selling the World Cup to the Aussie public because obviously, to them, state of origins to be all and end all." You, you can understand why. No, I, I'm really looking forward to the whole tournament. I think the wheelchair tournament will be will be fascinating. I watched that the other week. I know we mentioned it, the, the England and France game. What what a sport that is. I mean, I, I wouldn't get involved. I, I would rather play the 30 in the side. Um, I think it's safer. <laughs> uh, and obviously the ladies, a good, a good chance for us to highlight. I think I think uh, we, we're a little bit behind the Aussies and the Kiwis in that, but, you know, the French team will be strong, the, the, the Welsh or whatever, you know, I think I think the Brazilians have got a team in the Women's World Cup. Yeah, it's crazy, it really is, but, um, no, the whole tournament will be brilliant and, and for a whole month, hopefully, most of BBC's media will be covered with Rugby League uh, and, and give us that, that highlight we deserve and uh, I just hope we make the most of it. Yeah, can't wait, Parky. I mean, we'll be doing it on the on the podcast. Won't we? Give us something to talk about after uh, after Salford season first. The more rugby league, the better for me. If it, it could go uh, twelve months all year round, it's as long as there's rugby league in our lives, you can't go wrong. But yeah, that's all the news we've got for this week. Um, I think we'll we'll slot in the um, the rugby league world of rugby league roundup. I think Rob calls it now. I've uh, got plenty of amateur stuff there to bring you on international. Uh, sorry, Australian rugby league. So we'll we'll pop that in now.
Here is this week's Devil in the Detail World of Rugby League Roundup, I think we're going to call it now, because it's had a few names recently, but here we go. Um, we'll start off this week with the National Conference Leagues, actually. On Saturday, the 2nd of July, it, in the Premier Division, Rochdale Mayfield were beaten at York Acorn by 28 points to 20. In Division 3, Oldham St. Anne's beat Drillington 60 points to nil. And uh, Waterhead Warriors had a good win. They beat Lee East by 40 points to 10. That game was poised at four apiece at halftime. Waterhead Warriors run away with it in the second half. So in the league tables, Rochdale Mayfield still mid-table. They've won seven from their 15 games. Saddleworth Rangers, who didn't play at the weekend, have won two from 14. They currently sit second bottom with Milford uh, bottom of the table. In Division 3, East leads the top with 28 points. Then follows Waterhead Warriors with 22 and Oldham St. Anne's with 20. The fixtures for this week, Saturday the 9th of July, Rochdale Mayfield at home to West Hull. In Division 1, it's Featherston Lions against Saddleworth Rangers. And in Division 3, Lee East faced Oldham St. Anne's and Waterhead Warriors out home to Seaton Rangers. Moving on to the North West Men's League, we've got fair, fairly little action again there this week. A lot of uh, no results, same as the youth leagues, but we'll go through what we have got for you. On Saturday the 2nd of July, in the North West Men's Trophy, Salford City Roosters 35, Wigan Springview 26, and West Bank Bears 40, Caddy's Head Rhinos 28. In the North... West Men's Shield, Newton Storm beats Sad, uh, sorry, Langworthy Reds by 32 points to 18. In Division 3, there was a league match between Liverpool Lizards and Rochdale Mayfield. That finished 56 points to 6 to Rochdale Mayfield. Eh? The fixtures for this week, Saturday the 9th of July, Division 1, Charlie Panthers face Bury Broncos. Pilkington Rex A are at home to Salford City Roosters. West Hart and Lions entertain Caddy Z in Division 3 Rochdale Mayfield they are at home to Liverpool Lizards Division 4 South and East Burtonwood Chargers face along with the Reds Higginshaw at home to Waterhead Warriors A in an Oldham Derby and Burtonwood Bridge play Oldham St Anne's A Moving on to the North West Youth League. As I said, there wasn't much action. There's no fixtures this weekend because of Magic Weekend, but the results from last weekend, these games played on Sunday. I think they were played, these. Division 1 of the under-18, Saddleworth Rangers 26, Blackbrook Royals 32. And in the under-16s, Division 3, Salford City Roosters beat Clockface Miners by 36 points to 28. So that's all we've got for you in the Youth Leagues. Well, moving across to Women's Rugby League, I won't go on about Salford uh, Red Devils ladies because we're talking about them in the main podcast. I know Rob's got quite a bit of information there, so we'll leave that for uh, for the podcast. But we'll have a look at the other bits and bobs that have been going on. Uh, in the Betfred Women's Super League South, last Saturday, Cardiff Demons beat Oxford Cavaliers by 94 points to nil. And on Sunday, the 3rd of July, Betfred Women's Super League Group 1, Wigan 12, Leeds 48. In Group 2 of the Super League, it was Bradford 14, Barrow 18, Wakefield 8, Castle. Four, Warrington 72, Lee Minor Rangers 0. And there was a result in the Betfred Super League South that was Bedford Tigers 22, London Broncos 40. And a late result from Sunday the 26th of June, which we didn't give out, was Bradford Bulls 0, Warrington 54. Four coming fixtures Saturday the 9th of July. Cardiff Demons face Bedford Tigers women. That's in the Women's Super League South at 2 o'clock on Saturday. And on Sunday, there's one fixture in the Betfred Women's Super League Group 2, and that's Warrington Wolves against Castleford Tigers. And finally, there was one more game last week. I don't think I read that out. There was a match at the Totally Wicked Stadium on Sunday. That was between St. Helens and Huddersfield Giants. St. Helens won that game by 62 points to nil. That was in Group 1. Right, I think what we'll do now is we'll head over 12,000 miles or so to the NRL. It was round 16. Uh, there were some big games at the weekend. Um, New Zealand Warriors, I think that that's probably the biggest one. They were back in action uh, it was 1,039 days since the Warriors took to Auckland's Mount Smart Stadium. They've been a long time away from uh, New Zealand. And they were at home to West Tigers, their homecoming. And they won the game by 22 points to 2. So a big win for New Zealand Warriors. The rest of the scores, St. George, Illawarra Dragons, 12. Canberra Raiders, 10. South Sydney Rabbit Rabbitohs, 30. Parramatta Reels, 12. North Queensland Cowboys, they continue their fantastic run. They beat Brisbane Bron- Broncos by 40 points to 26. Canterbury Bulldogs, 6. Cronulla Sharks, 18. Penrith Panthers 26, Sydney Roosters 18, uh, Newcastle Knights 38, Gold Coast Titans 12 and Manly Seagulls 36, Melbourne Storm 30, so a big win there for Manly Seagulls, so the, the league table at the moment before we look at the fixtures, Penrith Panthers stay top, they've won 15 from 16, they've got 30 points, they're 6 points clear of 2nd place Melbourne Storm who've got 24 points. Uh, that's North Queensland Cowboys Cronulla Sharks Brisbane Parramatta South Sydney Rabbitohs and St George Illawarra Dragons who make up the playoff places bottom of the table is Gold Coast Titans on 6 points followed by West Tigers
Tigers who have eight points. The fixtures for this week, Thursday the 7th of July is the Sky Television game. That's Cronulla Sharks against Melbourne Storm at 10.50 in the morning. On Friday at 10.55 it's Newcastle Knights against South Sydney Rabbit Holes. On Saturday 10.35 on Sky Telly it's West Tigers against Parramatta Reels. And on Sunday the 10th at 5 past 7 in the morning on Sky Television again it's Brisbane Broncos against the St. George Illawarra Dragons. Well, finally this week, we'll turn our attention to domestic um, action. It was round 17 of Super League last week. Casford Tigers beat Huddersfield Giants on Friday night by 26 points to 18. Catalan Dragons beat St. Helens 20 points to 18 on Saturday in a real thriller in Perpignan. Hull FC 16, Leeds Rhinos 62. Toulouse Olympic 28, Hull Kingston Rovers 6. Wakefield Trinity 22, Wigan Warriors 46. And Warrington Wolves 24, Salford Red Devils 32. So that leaves the Super League. St. Helens are top with 28 points there two points in front of Wigan Warriors now a second Catalan Dragons a third Huddersfield Giants fourth Castleford and Hull FC make up the top six and seventh place Salford then Hulkingston Rovers and Leeds Rhinos uh, are the rest there so we're not far off that, that playoff spot now Salford the rest of the scores going on to the championship was round 17 there Batley Bulldogs 26 Whitehaven 26 Bradford Bulls 6 Lee Centurions 56 Dewsbury Rams 12 Halifax Panthers 38 Featherstone Rovers 58 Newcastle Thunder 22 London Broncos 36 Sheffield Eagles 28 Workington Town 0 Widnes Vikings 38 York City Knights 16 Barrow Raiders 24 The round 16 game on Monday was Barrow Raiders 18 Halifax Panthers 43 So the Panthers of Halifax doing really well in the championship Lee Centurions stay top with 16 wins from 7 17 matches. Then follow Featherstone, York City Knights, Halifax Panthers, Batley Bulldogs and Barrow Raiders making up the playoff places. In Betfred League 1, it was round 13. Cornwall 24, Hunslet 36, Keithley Cougars 86, West Wales 0, Midlands Hurricanes 34, Rochdale Hornets 42, North Wales Crusaders 30, London Scholars 16 and Swinton Lions were beaten surprisingly by Doncaster at home 26 points to 12. Doncaster continue their good run. So Keithley stayed top with 12 wins from 12 matches. Swinton Lions are uh, uh, second with nine wins from 12. Then it's North Wales Crusaders, Rochdale Hornets, Doncaster and Hunslet making up the playoff places. The fixtures for this week. It all kicks off on Friday night. Newcastle Thunder play Bradford Bulls. That's his premier sports television game at quarter to eight. Sheffield Eagles are at home to Batley Bulldogs. On Saturday 9th of July, it's Betfred Magic Weekend. round. Uh, well, the first round of it. There's three games on Saturday and three on Sunday. So the Wakefield play Toulouse at half past two. These are all telly games. Uh, on Sky, that's half two on Saturday. St. Helens against Wigan at 4.45. Then it's Leeds Rhinos against Casford at 7 o'clock. Uh, also in Betford League, one on Saturday. Cornwall plays Doncaster, one o'clock on the hour league gap. London Scholars are at home to Keith Lee Cougars. Midland Hurricanes are at home to North Wales Crusaders. That's a tea time game at half past five on Sunday. Huddersfield Giants against Salford. That's a one o'clock kickoff on the telly. Catalan Dragons against Warrington Wolves. It's also on the telly at quarter past three. Then it's finished off by Hulkingston Rovers against Hull FC at half past five. All those games at St. James's Park. Of course, Betfred Championship on Sunday Barrow at home to Whitehaven at 3 o'clock London Broncos face Featherstone Rovers at 3 o'clock Witness Vikings at home to Dewsbury at 3 Workington Town face Leeson Insurance at 2 o'clock Betfred League 1 on Sunday Hunslet against West Wales Raiders at 3 Oldham play Rochdale in a derby at 3 o'clock and there's one game next Monday the 11th of July Betfred Championship Halifax Panthers are at home to the York City Knights that's all I've got for you this week take care have a good week and enjoy your time in Newcastle if you're up there following Salford and uh, have a great time right pack it I think we'll finish off this week by having a look at the uh, the preview we'll have a look at our uh, opponents this weekend at the Magic Week and Huddersfield Giants it's time for the devil of the details They're going pretty well this season. I, th- I thought they were pretty unlucky in the Challenge Cup final, but they were on a really good run in the league. I think they won six games on the spin in the league, but came unstuck last Friday against Castleford Tigers. Did you see that game? I did, yeah. I think um, I think the last two games have been a little bit disappointed by their standards and by Ian Watson's standards. We know what what you you know, we know what, he's a proper student of the game, don't we? He'll he'll watch every single part of what what they've done over the last couple of weeks and picked it apart in training. Uh, and he'll have his, his guys ready for for us this week. They they've been brilliant all year. They've they spent a few quid on on the squad. They've built it well. Still got players there that have been there, you know, a long time. Kojo, McGilvray, Lawrence, people like that. Uh, a real base to work from. But they've got some real talent, haven't they? I mean, young Price at the back, Will Price. What what a, what a kid he is. Um, 
And then, you know, he's got Tui Lola here to run him around the pitch. I think Danny Levi's been excellent for him, probably one of the farm hookers in the league this year. Um, so, yeah, they've been on a real good run uh, and, and rightly up there in the top four this season and, and where they should finish. Uh, they've got a big, strong squad. Um, I think they'll even be better next year, which is, you know, a little bit worrying. But, uh, yeah, overall, it, it's going to be a massive test for us. Um, I know we're enjoying a little period of our own, but I think this is that next step up from, from the teams we played in the last few weeks. Um, they're, they're, they're a proper, solid, professional outfit, Huddersfield. They give us a... They gave us a bit of a going over at their place early in the year. We we didn't perform, but they were they were good that day. And like you say, they were unlucky in the Challenge Cup final, and that could have that could have damaged their season. You know, the Reds could have fell off a little bit, and but they didn't. They've just got stronger. Um, and I think I think we're in for a, a big tussle this week against well a lot a lot of ex Reds. Um, so it should, it should be interesting. Yeah, like you said, a lot of ex Salford players are there. They were they also had a bit of a transfer movement in the last week or so. They've Swapped Jake Wardle with Toby King, which I which I found a bit it was strange. When Jake Wardle just broke into the the England team, he's he's probably a bit younger as well. And Toby King's not really been in his straps at Warrington, so I thought that was a a funny one. Ian Watson has obviously seen something in that, um. So we'll have to we'll have to see how that one goes. There's no doubt Toby King's a, a talented player, but yeah, a strange one. But good pack of forwards at Huddersfield. Uh. And Josh Jones is in it. I mean, one player who always impresses me, Chris Hill, obviously. But that Chris McQueen. I think uh, he's he's another one. He's he's a talisman and all. He scores a lot of tries and he's a dangerous player. He's always in the right place at the right time. He backs up well. Um, so I, I think there's an awful lot to to look out for there in that side. But I think between the two of us, we score a lot of points as well, don't we? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to say Chris McQueen. I heard someone saying on Sky the other week about he's obviously he's eligible to play for England. Mm. He should be in the World Cup squad. And when you go in a form, you've got to look at him and go, do you know what? If he was couple of years younger, you wouldn't even question it. He's been that good this year. Um, uh, and we've got one of our own in Cal Watkins, who's hit the same sort of you know thing at the moment, where he's, he's made a move to the back row. So that, that that could be an interesting little battle to look out for. That. Yeah, they, they do. They, they can score points. I mean, you know, big Jerry McGill on the wing, takes some stopping, doesn't he? So we'll have our work cut out there. But they have, they've got good pace in the backs. Big, big, strong back line as well. That's the other thing. They're, they're a very physical side um, and one player who I, I begrudge mentioning him but I, I, I have to is Luke Yates I think he's been absolutely sensational for us he never stops his tireless work he, he tackles hard he runs hard that try is good at, at, at Craven Park the other week where he just caught the ball and went and he, he was leaving players in his wake and he said he's a big he's a biggish lad you know he, he shouldn't be doing that so he's obviously got a turn of pace about him um, but he's been a real leader for Luke Yates, uh, like you mentioned, Josh Jones in the back row. So probably our big Seb uh, Ikehifo out there as well against us. Um, but they have, yeah, they're all all round a strong, strong team, real, real leaders out there. And you mentioned Chris Hill, and I, I said after the Warrington game, that was one of Warrington's biggest mistakes, letting him go. Yeah, because he's, he's he was a proper leader. He was one of them that would have been on that park on Sunday at twenty four eight and said. Let's just calm down. And when we scored one back, he would have said, that's it. There's no more, you know. That, that, you do need a leader out there. And he'd have been that man. And I think I think Warrington was silly letting him go and, and Huddersfield have benefited from it. Um, but they have all round. You, you, you struggle to find too many weak spots in the Huddersfield team. They're, they're really, really strong. And, you know, it, it's, it's painful for Salford fans, you know, in, in so many ways, looking at, you know, the head coach and the players they've got there that were, of all sort of represented us, but it just sets a different challenge for us. And, and at the moment, the, the way we're playing, the confidence we've got, we, we don't need to fear anyone. And as as I said a few minutes ago, there's no pressure on Salford now. You know, people were expecting us to finish in the bottom three. We're one place outside the playoffs with a better points difference than the team above us. Uh, you know, and that's all FC who spend God knows how much money every year on the team. So. We can go and play with that, that freedom um, and probably cause Huddersfield uh, a lot of problems. Um, like I say, Huddersfield are a really strong team and, and they play to a structure. But if we can get around that and upset that structure a little bit, make them think more, you know, and, and give them a bit of a wobble, then then we've got every chance of winning this game. 
Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. I think out of all the games, I mean, there's three games on the Saturday, three on the Sunday. I think this one could be the, the, the match of the week. And obviously, Wakefield and Toulouse looks a, looks a good game. Doesn't they? They're battling out at the bottom of the table. You've got the old derby, you've got Wigan against Saints. But this one could be could be the one. It really could. There's a, I, don't, I don't like mentioning Ian Watson and the, the sort of stuff there. It's, it's, it's in the past now. But he's still there. It's, there's still a bit of needle, I suppose, isn't there? And amongst the supporters and things like that. And, and the ex-players as well, when you've got ex-players playing against their old club. So there, there will be that there. And I think it's healthy that sometimes in sport, isn't it? You have to have these rivalries and, and have something on the game. So uh, so I'm expecting a really good contest. Can I ask you for a score prediction? Yeah, I'm going into it full of confidence, which, which is generally a bad thing. Um, but I'm going to go for us just just to edge it in in a in a bit of a thriller. I'm going to say we, we'll, we'll just take it thirty twenty eight. Thirty twenty eight. Yeah, right. I, I just I, I don't know. I mean, Huddersfield could easily, and I, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, I, I wish us all the best, but Huddersfield could easily tear us apart. They yeah. could take us apart bit by bit this week. Uh, because they'll be fresher, because they've got more players, bigger squad, playing a little bit. You know, they 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 they've probably got better players overall. Um, but I just think we can get amongst them a little bit and upset things. And uh, yeah, I, I think if we if we get get a lead, we might we might be just a bit a bit too much to stop. Thirty twenty eight. I'm gonna go. I'm the same. I think it's gonna be a tight game. I think there might be a drop goal in it. I'm going to go Salford 23, Huddersfield 18. I'm going to go another, another tight game. Uh, obviously, we, we we can make one up for Rob, can't we? He'd probably go Salford 40, Huddersfield 6, because he's, he's usually yeah. pretty confident in yeah, Rob, isn't that, he? But, that'll do. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, mate, it's been good. I've enjoyed yeah. this this podcast. We'll send this over to to Rob now. Let him do the magic, put it all together, and uh, and yeah, I've been Paul White. I said he's been uh, Paul Parkin. Thanks very much, Paul, for joining us. No, thanks. Thanks, mate. It's been really good. And, uh, you know, good luck to the Reds this weekend. It's a big weekend. And uh, let's just hope the whole thing goes off uh, really well. Yep, safe journey to everybody travelling up to Newcastle. If you're going up for the Saturday, the Sunday, or the full weekend, or whatever, enjoy yourselves, have a good time, and let's bring on those two points for us all. But we shall see you next week.